I'm very honored to be here tonight with this great audience and also with um, my colleague here, Sonia Tates, who's written a very haunting book called The Watchmaker's Daughter. Uh, we'll tell you about both the watchmaker and the daughter, but Sonia, let me ask you, um, you're the daughter, tell us about the watchmaker. Who is he, what was he like, what was it like to live with him? Well, I was born into a family of, of a heroic couple who had survived the Holocaust and who seemed to me more like um, victors than victims. And so my father was a very charismatic man. I would say that physically you could combine Yul Brynner as, as in the role of king in The King and I, uh, and he was also a good dancer and particularly a good waltzer, and um, with Pablo Picasso, a man who always looked sort of old but never got old. Um, and he had saved lives in the Holocaust. So he had become a watchmaker because um, it was through very unfortunate circumstances, but his life had a way of turning everything, an alchemical way of turning lead into gold. His father had been shot. My father was a baby of three when his father was shot by the Cossacks. And his father had been a miller by a river mill. And his mother, my namesake, Sonia, um, had to sort of scramble to protect her three kids. When my father, her youngest, turned 13, he had to apprentice, find a trade, not stay in school, and he chose watchmaking. And he really took to it, and he became a master watchmaker. So, you know, flip the calendar, years go by, and um, the Russians came into his country, Lithuania. He lost his shop and his Harley. He'd become really successful. The Harley was an index of that uh, high life. And then after that, the Nazis came, and lo and behold, when they asked each person who looked hale and hearty what their profession was, he didn't say lawyer, which would have been useless to the regime, um, but watchmaker. And, and, and it's sort of cliche, but the Germans have, had, have or had a tremendous respect for punctuality. And my father could fix any timepiece, you know, from the smallest pocket watch to, the, to Big Ben. So um, that saved his life. He not only became a watchmaker in the Dachau concentration camp, but he was able to save other prisoners, these sort of um, you know, sad people who were starving and weak and really couldn't stand confinement as most of us couldn't. He would let them in and say, I need a, an assistant, and he would show them how to put the loop in their eye and play with the micro tools and sort of, I suppose, caution them not to break anything. And soon he had a workshop of a lot of watchmakers. So that was living with a hero, um, and my mother had saved her mother, and, so, and she had come to America um, and she was dewy and cute, and her color scheme was flowers. And she played the piano. She had been at a conservatory about to graduate when the Nazis came. And so she played for us, and I would lie under the piano listening. So my household, it was a very strange place of clocks ticking, cuckoos cuckooing, pendula swing, swinging, and hearing Rachmaninoff and Chopin, um, all while living in a two times and places, you know, the past and the present, which was America and had nothing to do with any of that. But when you grew up, at least for the first several years, you did not really know this story of your, this particular story of your father's heroism, of what he did in Dachau. It's almost like a coincidence that, tell us how you found out about that. Oh, well, I have to say, um, Howard, that I, I didn't know that he was a hero, but a lot of people who've come out of um, my experience, which is an American child born of immigrants, in particular um, war refugees, and, and most particularly the Holocaust, didn't get to hear. And there was this sort of a feeling of silence because the people were traumatized, must have been, and um, had no, no one was aware of that. And they kind of went on with their lives. And I felt like, heroically, there was no one I knew that didn't get up in the morning and shave and get out and go to work. Well, my parents did all that, but they talked about it nonstop. So although I didn't know about his heroism, I did know um, that they'd been in camps because it was day one topic as I, you know, entered the Mount Sinai, you know, uh, you know, uh, birth room. I'm, I'm sure that I was told something about the Holocaust. Like it hurt more than in the Holocaust, you know. <laughs> and so, um, actually, my mother was in a twilight sleep. But so anyway, that's not. She always explained that giving birth was painless, and then I found out to the contrary that. Having, having babies in that era was painless. Um, but in any case, I, I only learned about my father's heroism at that time, the specific thing. But they both seemed to me very unbroken, very, very together. And then they also like linked it to things. So they would link the fact that they were in the Holocaust to great things. They'd say, well, I had tears, but then I had joy. And there were these psalms that, you know, I took you, you were, you were having a really bad time, my love. And then I, you know, whisks you over to paradise. And those are typical psalms that David wrote to comfort the, a depressed king. Um, and then they sent me to a religious Jewish day school. And so 
right away, you know, every holiday made sense. You know, the typical joke Jews make about the holidays, they tried to kill us, they didn't win, let's eat. But, <laughs> and so for me, Passover was my father's story. I mean, it was almost like being a Kennedy. Like, my father's telling me things that are happening in the real world. We're having Passover, and that's about being a slave and being released. Uh, and he did tell me um, when I was very little about having a Nazi make him uh, matzah. That was, a, that was an interesting, do you want to hear that story? Tell us about when you were, you went to, uh, to Israel for the first time. Yes. And you're there with your father, and then people start gathering. They recognize him, and they say, he saved us, he saved us. Tell about that moment. That's really your moment of discovery of what he did with the watchmaker shop in Dachau. Yes, Dachau. yes, it's, it's true. So um, when I was 10 years old, my brother was 13, my older brother. And for a present for him, we went to Israel. And we were quite un, un rich. So I remember going there with about seven stops, and I got to see, I thought I got to see Athens and Rome and Paris. and. Anyway, finally we arrived and um, we went to Jerusalem and we went into this park and my father was admiring the fact that there were so many trees and the country was green and just saying how things could be born out of the dust and the, and the sand and the desert and the swamp. And I was just like having Jerusalem syndrome. I'm sure my eyes were as big as, you know, pie plates. And then people started to come out of the, um, sort of out of all the trees in all the directions. And um, they gathered around my father and a group of them said, are you Tate's the one who saved us? And so um, I thought my father was pretty great, but this I hadn't expected this. This was more than, you know, here I worshiped him anyway. And that's how I learned that he had saved lives, as I've mentioned before, in uh, Dachau. So, so it was um, a very, I guess, a very climactic moment for me and a very much a homecoming to see that even if you were in the worst circumstance, you could be standing on a beautiful, under a beautiful palm tree in a place like Jerusalem and feel nothing but admiration for courage that in the darkest times someone could be helping other people. And that was very, that was very, um, being a hero, doing something, instead of sitting back and watching, uh, was one of the big legacies that my father gave me. Um, but also, at the same time, I think living with your father was not easy. There was a, there was a, a difficult and dark and, and violent side of that. Please tell us. Um, my father, okay. Um, so my father had a very, very bad temper. I guess his Shakespearean flaw would be that he had a very bad temper, and I think that's where the Holocaust went, into these periodic eruptions of rage. Not uncaused. It used to be if someone, like my brother was um, in my neighborhood, which was Washington Heights, um, full of yeshivas, you know, Jewish day schools, and um, refugees from, from Europe, fairly observant and close-knit community. My brother was a maverick or sort of a Huck Finn, and he didn't fit in very well. And my father hadn't had a father. And so my brother's um, sometimes age appropriate and sometimes fresh responses to him, like my brother would learn from the TV that you say, you know, you know, you don't understand anything, daddy, that kind of thing. My father would freak out. So he had been, I think, pushed too many times to, in too many ways, and he didn't understand that. So my brother would often enrage him, and that was an issue in the family that my father really didn't understand my brother and chose me as the honorary boy, I guess, the honorary heir and the honorary, um, you know, Olympic runner. Here's the torch, you go and run. And so, yeah, he, he definitely um, would lose his temper and I would be very worried about him. And I, I did think about the Psalms of David, how, you know, when King Saul was crazy, he needed David to write Psalms. And I think that I was the David that always tried to console and comfort my father. And in turn, he consoled and comforted me because he had already told me the world is really black and white. It's got some very bad people in it, and we're not safe. And there's so many other levels than the one you're looking at. You know, I'm watching Romp Room, and everything seems pretty safe, except that she never calls out my name um, because it's it's not Kathy and Peter. But you know, just to just to sort of make the world safe, I, I you know I I think he gave me a lot of strength, and I think in turn I gave him a lot of strength. But it wasn't easy. I don't think it's an easy relationship to be your father or mother's confidant and um, sort of, you know, tiny midget messiah. <laughs> and re remember, remember what happened when you came home from summer camp at one point? You said, Dad, I, I learned something at summer camp. <laughs> uh -oh. Okay, I see where you're going with this. So, um, yes, that's pretty much how I became a writer, my father's final um, attack on me. He almost never, ever got angry at me. For one thing, we were on the same page, literally like a page of Torah. No, we were on the same page about most things. And um, I was good at school, and he loved that. He had not had his education. He was like, How, what did you learn today? And I would tell him. And, um, 
And then I got very good grades, and my father wanted me to go to law school, so we were, I was definitely running a very good race. But I went to summer camp, and that wasn't about at all about academics or being a good girl. And in my camp, it was a Jewish camp, but 